Hi sociologists, um, so this is the first of um, uh, lectures really that should be classroom lessons but I've converted it into a YouTube lecture um, to try and support you in more, some more challenging sort of concepts to, in this case to do with the functionalist view of crime and deviance. So here are four questions um, I would like you to have a think about, you might have done this in advance. Um, you could write them on an A3 bit of paper and you can mind map around them as we move through the lecture. But first of all, I'd like you to have a go at adding your own ideas, examples, based on the notes that you'll have taken from the previous functionalism um, crime and deviance lecture. So first one I want you to write down, uh, what do you know from the functionalist point of view? What, why is crime functional or good for society according to functionalists? Okay, any examples you can think of to illustrate that? Um, also, crime is inevitable in society, according to Durkheim and functionalists. Um, why? So what points can you think of to put there? Um, anime, key concept uh, from Durkheim, um, and he argued that anime leads to crime. Um, why? So you can start off by defining anime there. Uh, and finally, so what is it that causes crime, according to functionalists? Okay, if you can make a simple list, what are the causes of crime, according to functionalists? So if you haven't already done that, please pause the lecture now and have a go at annotating your own ideas around those questions. So what I'm going to do is nip through these four sections and also do some of the evaluation stuff with you in this particular lecture. Um, so let's get started looking at crime being functional or good. Um, so one of the arguments that hopefully you've got down is that crime is good or crime is functional for society because it actually helps create social change. Um, and I've got a couple of examples here for you to think of and hopefully you've got down those examples from the other lecture. So things like, uh, you know, Martin Luther King um, and the suffragettes, both of them seen as deviant in their time or criminal to an extent. Many suffragettes went to jail or Nelson Mandela in South Africa went to jail. And yet now we look at their deviance as actually they were... They were, well, as it says here, there in that quote, Durkheim argued that today's deviant can become tomorrow's beacon of morality. They are, they're beacons of morality. They're, they're all celebrated in their actions and what they did, even though it was deviant slash criminal at the time. So they created positive social change in that case. So suffragettes, gender equality, Nelson Mandela, and of course, Martin Luther King, um, sort of civil rights equality um, for particularly the black community. Um, so what I've got here is an extract from a Guardian article. Um, if you've got a QR reader on your phone, um, which would be difficult if you listen to this lecture on your phone, but anyway, you can just quickly scan that QR code and it'll take you straight to this lecture on the, uh, sorry, this article on the Guardian website. Um, and this is in relation to the recent um, protests in America, the George Floyd protests and riots, which, you know, rioting would be considered a crime. Um, uh, that I think can possibly be used to illustrate Durkheim's view um, about the idea of today's deviant becoming tomorrow's beacon of morality and hopefully creating social change. Um, so yes, to have a quick read through this extract, there's lots of stuff in here that sounds like a functionalist argument. So this idea that uh, when people are systematically beaten, killed, not given the resources to thrive, rebellion becomes inevitable. It serves as a human response to conditions that become so untenable that rising up has become instinctual despite the consequences. Social transformation has long been forged in the ashes of rebellion. Although today, rebellion is only acknowledged as a potent tool in retrospect. OK, um, and then a bit later on the article, I've taken another extract here. Police violence, white vigilantism and poverty, are all of which directly threaten people's existence, are true violence. And this is what the protests are reminding us of. Um, because if you look at the narrative about these protests, um, it's very much about the, the violence and the riots and the damage to pu public property or private property. We've had a recent one in Bristol with the statue of its Edward Colston, who made his money through the slave trade being dragged through the streets and thrown into the river in Bristol um, and quite a lot of the reporting around that is like this is violence this is irrational this is terrible behavior and actually you know maybe in five years time ten years time we'll look back at these moments and go wow those that's when it happened you know that was the the, the catalyst for the social change that was necessary to stop this kind of stuff happening so I can't say that there's been social change created by these protests yet, but the Black Lives Matter movement has been going for several years in reaction to, unfortunately, dozens and dozens and possibly hundreds of cases where um, black 
men predominantly have been killed in police custody. Um, so the social change uh, we're, we're possibly looking here, for here is, you know, we need more equality within different ethnic communities in America and possibly in the UK as well. Uh, and we certainly need significant reform of the police forces um, in America and their attitudes towards all ethnic minority groups, but particularly the black community. Um, and I know that, the, you know, the Minneapolis has um, promised to, I think, dismantle its police force and then build it from the ground up in order to make sure this doesn't happen again. So that's a good example of an element of change. And yet that won't tackle the, if you like, the underlying issues in American society with inequality between different ethnic communities. We need something a bit bigger to happen there. Um, so, yeah, that's just what, an interesting example, I think, that illustrates uh, where, you know, crime and deviance can actually be a catalyst for social change. But we've obviously got to watch this space and see what happens. Um, another example um, I wanted to draw your attention to um, was um, the really tragic case of um, Sarah Payne, um, uh, which led to what's known as Sarah's Law. Um, and this is really hard, I think, to consider as a, something that was good for society. But, you know, perhaps from a functionist point of view, it was. Uh, so she was eight when she was abducted and she was murdered by a, a guy called Roy Whitting. Um, and he was convicted and jailed for his crime. But what emerged after his trial, that he already had a conviction for abducting and sexually assaulting an eight year old girl. And he'd been to jail for it prior to that. And he was living in this area. But there was no none of the parents knew that this known sex offender was living in the area um so sarah's law um came about because her parents campaigned for it and the newspaper the news of the world which is no longer in circulation in the uk um, and they argued that if they'd known that there was a known sex offender in the area, they would have taken different steps uh, to protect their daughters um, and they would their daughter, sorry, uh, and this would not have happened possibly. Uh, this law is now uh, now come into effect. It's known as the Child Sex Offender Disclosure Scheme, and it means that parents with young children can formally ask the police if someone ha has access to a child has a criminal record for sex child of so child sex offences. So arguably that that terrible case that awful crime has actually generated positive social change because we've got a law now that sort of prevents to an extent those sorts of crimes happening again uh, although obviously sometimes they still do so that but that is an example of a terrible crime leading to positive social change so that's a good example to remember um, as well as the ones I've discussed with you in the other lecture as well so why else is crime functional or good? Well, uh, Durkheim's really big into this idea of boundary maintenance. So um, in the other lecture, I spoke to you a bit about how, you know, public hangings, very good for boundary maintenance. If you see someone getting hung for theft, um, so losing their life, you might sit there and go, well, I'm not going to do that because that looks pretty awful. Um, so yeah, by crime, when you see crime being punished, this reinforces the value consensus through the policing of the margins of behaviour. So if you've got socially acceptable behaviour in the middle, okay, what most people will do, and then you've got the margins of socially acceptable behaviour, to keep people within those margins, if you think of a, of a, a circle, um, you've got a range of formal and informal sanctions. Okay, so I've got an example there in that picture. That's community service. That's a very visual punishment that will remind passers by that, yes, criminals are being punished, so justice is being done, but it'll also remind them, right, I don't want to commit a crime because I don't want that to happen to me. And that's very much a formal sanction. Uh, the other example I just want to talk to you about quickly is um, Harvey Weinstein's case. And, you know, we can talk about Kevin, although I spelled Kevin wrong there, Kevin Spacey's case in Hollywood. Now, Harvey Weinstein has got a criminal conviction for being a, um, a rapist now. Um, but and that's a formal sanction that will hopefully put people off doing that kind of activity or, or treating women in that way again. Um, but actually, the other what, the other thing I want to talk to you about is the informal sanction there, because Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey have been completely ostracised from Hollywood completely. Obviously, Harvey Weinstein's in jail, which, you know, is fairly effective ostracization, but Kevin Spacey isn't. Um, and that that could serve as a very serious reminder to others that that kind of behaviour, like sexual exploitation, sexual abuse, um, will absolutely not be tolerated. And if you look at how they've been utterly 
I say vilified, but they were like villains. So I wouldn't say the media is over exaggerating. Um, the way the media treated them and, you know, really called them out on their behavior, um, that would put off anyone from that sort of behavior in that industry. So that's an informal agent, which is the media sanctioning those two men. And there's been other cases as well. Um, and that's a useful form of social control because it means everyone else will look at that and go, right, that's a horrible punishment. I don't want that to happen to me. That's clearly wrong. It's also reminding us of the behaviors that are right and wrong. Uh, so it polices everyone else's behavior. Um, you know, and that's obviously led to the hashtag Me Too movement. So um, I've said there, um, it's also a good example. The Harvey Weinstein case particularly is a good, good example of creating social change in attitudes through the Me Too campaign. Um, so you can use that for boundary maintenance and social change, because now I think there is a lot less tolerance for, if you like, um, yeah, I think the mistreatment of people from a sexual point of view, uh, particularly about the matter of consent, uh, especially where there's power is concerned. So someone with more power is perhaps having a sexual relationship with someone with less power that is now looked at as perhaps a form of exploitation, whereas prior to this case, it maybe wasn't. Um, so this is new content for the new spec. Um, so it wouldn't have been on the other lecture. Um, and again, it's looking at this idea that crime is functional and good. So just thinking about deviants, um, functionalists argue, neo-functionalists anyway, so new functionalists argue that deviants can be regulated in society to prevent crime and let certain groups let off steam, which allows us to maintain social stability. Um, so some good examples of this, um, particularly to do with, I guess, the youth, young people, which you know, statistically, the young people are more likely to be involved in criminal activity. So if we can manage their deviance, then we could perhaps lower crim criminality. So things like festivals, um, violent sports like MMA, wrestling, boxing, rugby, I don't know, aggressive sports as well. Uh, and things like Freshers Week, there is a certain level of misbehaviour which is tolerated in those environments, which perhaps wouldn't be elsewhere. So just thinking about festivals, you know, it might be, you know, drug use, um, you know, excessive drinking, uh, possible nudity to an extent. That wouldn't be tolerated in mainstream society. But in those kinds of environments, that, that those groups are given the opportunity to let off that steam, okay, be deviant which perhaps stops them or prevents them wanting to act in that way in mainstream society. Um, likewise, Freshers' Week, you know, the first couple of weeks of university, there are certain behaviours that young people will engage in that they certainly wouldn't do in their hometown, okay, when they're away from the social control of their families and neighbours, for example. Um, and like I said, in violent sports, you know, you've got physical, uh, uh, well, physical assault almost becomes part of the game, if you like. Um, and it's worth thinking about that if you have societies with very little or no crime or deviance, like, are they really healthy? Um, and I'll come to that in the next slide in a minute or in a couple of slides down. So countries that have really high levels of control, so therefore there is no crime or deviance because people are terrified. Like, are they actually healthy societies? Are the individuals in those societies functioning well? Um, so a couple of new sociologists for you to think about. Um, First one is King, well, say new, Kingsley Davies, uh, 1967. Now he argued that prostitution is good for society. So before I tell you the answer, can any of you think, or give, maybe give this a pause, how on earth can prostitution, and he, in this case, he talks about men using prostitutes, not women, men using prostitutes, how can that be good for society, in particular, the family? Any ideas? Maybe make a note. Well, maybe some of you've got it. Arguably, according to Kingsley Davies, it helps the monogamous nuclear family through the release of men's sexual frustrations and prevents family breakup. Um, so I think the argument he's getting at there is that instead of perhaps um, the husband having an affair with maybe a, a work colleague or you know a, maybe a secretary at work, if I'm going to stereotype, or or a friend. Um, which, and if they did have that affair, you know, maybe they would leave the wife and the family and go off with this person, um, this other woman. If they actually just used a prostitute, 
to release their sexual frustration, there's a very limited chance they're going to like leave their family for a prostitute. Um, so as a result, they won't be breaking up the family. So that's great. The husband's going to be able to use prostitutes, but the monog monog monogamous nuclear family will be nice and stable, which is great for society because of equal socialization and what have you. Anyway. Uh, Ned Pol Polsky, uh, same year, 1967, um, similar vein, he actually argued that pornography is also very good for the family slash society as it is an alternative to adultery um, slash sexual attacks. So again, just thinking about crime, obviously pornography isn't criminal, but it's definitely deviant, I guess, but in 1967, to an extent, some types of pornography definitely were deviant and criminal. Um, so if you argue, yeah, if they can watch pornography, um, are they less likely then to engage in adultery? If they can watch, you know, uh, extreme pornography, are they less likely to engage in sexual attacks? And I will come to the evaluation about this a bit later on, and we will look at gender and crime because you can evaluate Ned Polsky um, because there's plenty of research that's been done that the increase in aggressive pornography has actually led to an increase in violent sexual attacks against mainly women because... Um, it's what's that hypodermic needle model in media where, you know, if you watch enough of it on TV, you begin to think, oh, that's completely normal behaviour. So you feel that you can behave in that way. So we can 100% evaluate these two guys, uh, particularly Ned Polsky, using the argument that violent porn actually leads to more sexual violence. Anyway, moving on. Um, crime is inevitable. So according to Dirk, Dirk kind of functionalist, crime is inevitable in any society. A society of saints will have criminality. OK, um, and there's several different reasons for this. The first one is to do with anime. So crime is inevitable because not everybody is well socialised into the shared norms and values of society, which can lead to crime and deviance. And this can also cause anime. So the reasons why some people might not be socialised into shared norms and values um, may well be that, well, you know, if you come from a new writerish point of view, maybe they come from a broken family. OK, so they've only been raised by a single parent or maybe they've lived in care. Um, so they haven't had that balanced socialization. So they haven't learned the shared norms and values of everyone else in society. So as a result, they might not actually share the collective consciousness, which again can lead to them suffering anime. Um, also, um, and Durkheim did make a slight nod towards this, even though he was writing a good over a hundred years ago. Um, society is now becoming more diverse, okay? Now, he didn't refer to globalisation, but this is what's happening. So as we become more globalised, uh, there are more cultures living in, the same, living in the same nations, so we get competing sets of values and norms. So this can mean that some groups can be seen as deviant because they're different from the mainstream. So I've got the example here of Muslim women wearing a headscarf can be seen as, you know, deviant in a certain sense that it's just not normal, you know? You might look at someone wearing a headscarf and think, oh, well, that's perfectly socially acceptable, but they might stand out slightly because it isn't what everyone else is doing, which is the definition of deviance, like against the norms of society, even though it can be a bit of an offensive word. Um, taking it a step further, it's actually a crime in France to cover your face using a veil. Um, and in other countries as well, they, they can criminalise that behaviour. Um, so as we get this sort of multiculturalism in the UK and other countries, it's it's likely we're going to get more clashes of values and different ideas about what's right and wrong. You know, different communities have got different views on, I don't know, adultery, um, uh, homosexuality, um, for example. And there could be corresponding behaviours associated with that, maybe anger if someone is living a, I don't know, a homosexual lifestyle. Um, some people might view that as really deviant and maybe be quite abusive towards them, for example. Um, and obviously, as we do get more diverse communities living closely together, one of the sad effects is we get higher levels of hate crime and crimes linked to discrimination against minority ethnic groups. Uh, get a lot of that sort of this is my country, what are you doing here attitude, um, which can, you know, obviously is a crime if people are racially abused. OK, that is a type of crime or if they're discriminated against in the workplace and public transport and public spaces. That's obviously a crime. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about this concept, anime, because it's really important and we come back to it several times uh, throughout the year. Um, when someone suffers anime, they don't feel part of the collective consciousness. OK, they don't feel like they belong. So it can be really harmful. And you guys might have suffered anime at different points in your lives, possibly like when you've changed school or maybe you've moved to a brand new area. That sense of like you don't 
know anyone, you're not entirely sure how to act and behave, maybe you don't even know how to dress, perhaps. Um, that is almost a, a level of anime. Now, the issue is uh, that these people can are either don't know about the accepted norms and values or they don't care, okay, um, because they don't feel like they belong. They don't care about how people should and shouldn't behave. Uh, and this can lead to a breakdown of social bonds. They don't feel connected to the area around them. And so this is how, this is anime. And this can actually lead to people lacking socially acceptable ethical and or moral standards, which can lead to certain types of crime. So again, have a go, annotate on your notes. Can you think of any examples of crime that might happen if someone doesn't feel like they belong to an area? What sorts of crimes might they commit if they feel like they don't belong to an area or a community? Um, and also, what sorts of crimes might they commit if they just don't know or they don't understand the norms and values? There'd be very different types of crime. Um, so I've given you a few what examples of my own and hopefully you've added your own in there as well. Um, so if someone feels like an outsider, they will be, su they will suffer anime. Okay. And I've got the example here of Sasha Begum. Some of you might be aware of her. Uh, she was a British schoolgirl. Um, she left Britain to join ISIS and became an ISIS bride. She married one of the ISIS fighters and ISIS, I'm sure you're aware is, um, was a fairly active and is a fairly active terrorist organization uh, that is actively encouraging terror attacks back in the UK. Okay, so that is a very extreme example of what can happen if someone suffers anime. They, they, will, they, if they don't feel like they belong here, they will go and find somewhere where they do belong. And in this case, it was a very extreme, violent subculture. Okay, um, you know, ISIS is a good example of a subculture. Um, uh, this is a shot from, oh, I can't remember, I think it might be one of the high school shootings, one of the, and sadly many high school shootings in, in America. Um, an individual student has clearly felt so angry at his school community that he has taken a gun and he has shot his, you know, his classmates, his teachers. And, and I think anime is a real cause of that. And you look at some of the people responsible for these, like most often everyone says, oh, they were really quiet. They didn't have many friends. I hardly spoke to them. So that sounds like someone suffering anime. So again, that kind of real almost anger at not feeling like they belong um, and resentment can spill out into very violent criminality. Um, and then there's something slightly different here. This is another example. So if you live in a country and you feel like your country is changing rapidly because of perhaps globalization, you will suffer anime because you might say, oh, you know, when I was young, um, this was a completely white British area and now there's loads of immigrants living here, for example. That individual feels that they don't belong in their own community, perhaps because there's lots of diverse groups living around them. So you can get individuals suffering anime within their own country because perhaps their own country has changed so rapidly because of migration linked to globalization. And I've got um, a photo of some sort of offensive graffiti there um, comparing Muslim women to post boxes. And it says the only difference is the color, which is fairly horrendous. Um, so that is an example of crime, okay, against your own area, or maybe you live in that area because perhaps you don't feel like you belong there anymore because it's become a community that you don't recognize anymore because it's gone through rapid social change. So what is it that causes crime then? Um, inadequate socialization, um, like we mentioned before. So for example, if someone doesn't learn the value of hard work, for material reward, which is meritocracy, this can maybe lead to the view that theft or maybe living on benefits is a normal way to earn. Okay, so benefits obviously isn't criminal, but you know, many would argue it's a, seen as a deviant lifestyle, it's different to the norm, and of course, theft is certainly criminal. We said anime can lead to crime, discussed that in the previous slide. Globalization and the clash of values can lead to crime. Again, I've already discussed that. But I just want to talk to you about this last one here. Um, the idea that the crime can also indicate that something is wrong with society. Okay. So, and that's linked to that idea that we, social change is necessary. So if you get high levels of certain types of crime, it normally indicates that something is wrong and needs to be adjusted at a macro level in order to get rid of that criminality. So if you've got too much social control or too little social control, this can, um, be indicated by maybe civil rights movements, um, riots perhaps. 
But also if you've got too little social cohesion or social control, um, where perhaps the government hasn't got very firm control on, it, on its members of the community through the police and the army, or, or people don't respect the, the, the law, you then get lawlessness or chaos or, or sort of systems of anarchy, which again indicates that something needs to change at a structural level in society to prevent this. Um, so thinking about that something is wrong with society and some examples, um, I want to talk to you a little bit here about South Korea as an example. That's just one, there are many other countries. Um, so in societies where there is really high levels of social control, crime becomes much more likely. So if you do live in a, a state where you know you haven't got any means of expressing yourselves, there's no social media, that, well, there is me, social media, but it's monitored by the state. If you're not able to, to you know, read, you haven't got a free press, so all you read is government propaganda constantly, then you are much more likely to commit crimes against the state. So there could be resistant crimes such as vandalism, um, you know, like, you know, graffiti with sort of uh, messages of rebellion on there. Uh, illegal demonstrations, because quite often these countries with high levels of social control to demonstrate is actually against the law itself. Uh, smuggling, that could be in terms of getting people out of the country, smuggling in contraband, uh, smuggling in, you know, things like phones, for example, that you can use to communicate on your networks. So smuggling can increase. And of course, terrorism crimes against the state, okay? Because again, many people who live in these types of states actually want to change the state. So we'll use things like terrorism and, and, and violent attacks in order to do that. Um, and the other example I've got down on the left there is um, sort of the Ga Gaza and sort of Palestine with it sort of, and, and the Israel conflict that some of you might be aware of. Gaza is a tiny strip of land uh, that is separated from um, if you like, um, mainland Israel by that huge wall and the conditions within Gaza are fairly horrendous. Um, however, they are subject to high levels of control by the Israeli sort of police and military, um, the people who live within Gaza, which contains, like, if you like, the Arab population and Israel con it contains the predominantly Jewish population now. So anyway, um, they've got um, really high levels of social control in those areas. And this can actually lead to a sense of hopelessness, um, which can be really dangerous because if someone doesn't feel like they've got any control over their lives, they're completely hopeless, then they can develop what's known as like, I've, what I've got to do lose attitudes. So and then you might see quite high levels of violence, quite high levels of um, even suicide attacks or even just suicide, not just a suicide attack, because people who feel like they've got nothing to lose or nothing to even live for may sacrifice themselves, um, may against the state that's kind of trying to control them or just say they had enough and commit suicide, sadly. So those are some other examples linked to issues when something's wrong with a society, you can get these sorts of crimes appearing. Right, the final thing I want to nip through with you is the evaluation. And I appreciate this is currently a long lecture, but we would be doing this over probably three or four lessons. OK, so sorry, I'm just talking at you. Please do remember to pause and have a go at some of these activities as I'm going through them. OK, because that's what I'd be doing with you in class. OK, make the most of this time. So um, maybe have a go at doing this yourself. OK, uh, so there are two different ways of evaluating functionalism. Um, Let's have a go at critiquing the idea that crime is functional or good for society. Can you think of any arguments against this view that crime is good for society? I'm sure you can. There were some in the lecture, but can you think of anything else? So pause it and have a go at that. And then what we will do is go on about how we evaluate functionalist theories from other theoretical perspectives. So please pause, have a go at that activity on the left and then try and have a go at thinking how would other theoretical perspectives view the functionist view of crime so think about marxism and feminism they've got quite a lot of critiquing to do so yeah once you've done that hopefully you've paused and had a go at those activities um, then have a look at my information on the next slides because it's good for you guys to come up with your own ideas as well so is crime actually functional or good? What arguments are there against this? Um, well, certain crimes are definitely not functional for society. They create more division in society. They don't 
reinforce social solidarity. They don't remind us about how to behave. And the example I've given you there is sort of hate crimes and terrorism. So it's really hard to look at 9-11, for example, and think, oh, you know what, that really helped society in some way. It really helped everyone feel a bit more unified. It certainly didn't, okay? Yeah, fair enough. Maybe some people felt that they were unified against, I don't know, the, the Middle East, but actually that created a lot of Islamophobia within America. It created a lot of divisions within America. So I don't think you could say it was a it was a crime that actually brought people together. Um, so, and crime is a real problem for victims and society. So if you're a victim of a crime, uh, whether it's a robbery, um, a, a physical attack, um, I don't know, a, you know, a, a racial abuse. It certainly doesn't feel functional, okay? It doesn't feel like, oh, I'm glad I'm a victim because that means society will get better as a result of my victimization. Absolutely not. It's, it's still a problem for the victim. So functionalism arguably does ignore the victims and all this. Um, and there's plenty of evidence that just the fear of crime can oppress certain groups. So for example, the elderly and women, and we can do, do a quick nod towards the media here. The way the media reports certain crimes and over reports particular types of crimes can actually lead to these social groups changing their behavior because they're worried about crime. Uh, so for example, lot, the media does do a lot of over reporting of violence against women. Um, like in public places, like women being attacked, women being raped, women being abducted. So women can actually end up modifying their behaviour. They might go, well, I'm not going to go out tonight or I'm not going to dress a particular way because that's inviting a sexual attack, perhaps. And the elderly are fairly worried about crime because, again, the media over-reports on violent crime far more than the level of actual violent crime out there. So as a result, that social group will be more fearful of perhaps going out and about at particular times and actually perhaps are more likely to be scared of certain groups in society because they believe that they're going to you know commit crime against them quite unfairly um and just a quick note there is that the group that's much more likely to be a victim of crime is young men okay they're much more likely to be victims of crime compared to women and the elderly uh, white collar crime, uh, it's called white collar crime because the criminals generally wear a white shirt and collar and tie with a suit so the people doing it, they're generally well paid, uh, they're generally middle class, their crimes normally involve a certain level of intelligence. Um, so white collar crime will normally be things like ta you know, tax evasion, embezzling funds from your company, um, insider trading stocks, um, you know, high level technical crime, but that has huge financial rewards. Um, so it has no benefit to society as it's rarely punished. The crimes are pretty complex. They're really difficult to spot. Um, and it does harm society because huge amounts of money are disappearing from, you know, tax payments, for example. Um, so our state isn't being funded as adequately as it could be because these, these criminals are getting away with, well, robbery, basically, um, uh, because we haven't got the technology or perhaps the intelligence to kind of catch it. Uh, and finally, feminists, going back to that, uh, Kingsley Davis and Ned Polsky, uh, they are pretty critical, surprisingly, of the use of prostitutes. They would say it's not functional for the women in the family or the prostitutes themselves or the wives. Uh, and like I said before, they're very critical of the idea that porn is actually good because it prevents sexual violence. They say, actually, it tends to normalise sexual violence against spouses. And that's very much an unreported issue because... The, the spouse will feel that it's normal for them to be treated in that way, so they wouldn't report it. So it's very difficult actually to even detect and measure. So I just want to finish by evaluating um, functionalism using some of the other perspectives. So Marxism um, is a useful source of evaluation for, for functionalism. Uh, they would say that the values or the collective conscience uh, of society that is enshrined in law is actually the values of the ruling class, okay? So, and we will look at it when we look at Marxism, a huge amount of our laws are about the protection of property, about, um, you know, preventing protests, about making sure that um, private property is safe. And actually the punishments that go with some of those crimes are huge. So a crime against property is harshly punished but when you look at some of the crimes against people, so, you know, maybe being violent towards someone or sexually abusing someone, the punishments for those crimes are actually lower. So that suggests that perhaps our laws 
are much more about protecting property than people. But we'll come to that when we look at Marxism. And that's that point again, um, that it's when you look at what the police do and what they spend all their time doing, and like the, the cartoon in the right illustrates, is the police are out there uh, arresting, you know, rightly, um, people who are committing street crime, okay? Because yeah, obviously that's still harmful to the victims. But they're not spending the time and the resources, perhaps, in ta tackling that white collar crime, okay? So there's no boundary maintenance. So if you are a well off, generally, man, unfortunately, um, in a high paid role within a company and, you know, you, you realize you can get away with it, you'll just carry on doing it because no one's been punished. There's no boundary maintenance. Um, feminists suggest the function of theories are gender blind. Um, they ignore women or female criminality um, and they focus very much on working class boys as, as the perpetrators of crime. Um, and finally, functionalism, this is a general point, it's not that useful in preventing crime. It doesn't really help victims and it'd be hard to come up with a policy to get rid of crime based on functionalist views. Uh, so for example, if, one, if they say one of their causes is inadequate socialization, how can you come up with a law that makes sure that everyone is socialized exactly the same? You, you just can't, it's not realistic. Um, so that's just a few other ways of evaluating functionalism. So at this point, you should be able to answer all of these questions, okay? So have a go testing yourself. If you're stuck, go back through your notes. If you're really stuck, email me. Um, but yeah, all of these seven questions you should be able to comfortably answer now following this lecture and the other lecture. And you must be sick of the sound of my voice now. Thanks for listening.